have a calling from beyond the stars. The mighty, mighty and freedom, armor of the Almighty. Since September 11th, the world has discovered that George W. Bush is a born-again evangelical president. He has never hidden this from his fellow Christians, who see themselves in his words and actions. Solitary and ecstatic before Jesus, fiercely anti-hierarchical, deeply conservative and proud of it, missionary by definition, they claim a membership in the hundreds of millions worldwide. Who are they? What do they want? On the eve of America's presidential election, we look at these emissaries from the world's most powerful country. In August of 2004, 14,000 men gather to celebrate Jesus. They call themselves the Promise Keepers. Half rock concert, half prayer meeting, the Promise Keepers are typical of the religious fervor now sweeping America. The enormous success of Mel Gibson's film, The Passion, showed the depth of this sentiment. Its membership is exclusively male, and through Promise Keepers, they pledge themselves to becoming better husbands, better fathers, and to leading a more Christ-like life. Like in a giant karaoke club, screens allow the audience to sing along with Chris Tomlin, one of the stars of Christian Rock. Traveling across the U.S. offering a weekend of music and prayer, Promise Keepers has, since its start in 1991, become a part of the American landscape. Groups come by bus, sometimes from very far away. Many keepers bring their sons, traveling in congregations shepherded by their local pastors. It makes me a better dad, you know. Kids are releasing our kids today. You know? I need to teach my kids the Word of God, teach them to walk by God's principles. You know? Well, we're definitely in a spiritual revolution, you know, a spiritual warfare. Well, you've got uh, temptation from every angle. Being a man, you have temptation of lust, and of greed, and it's easy in today's time to fall into that if you're not careful about what you do. Well, uh, my wife, she's the one that tells me I've, I've changed considerably in what I was when I started before I started going in 96, it's, it's more you try to serve your family like Christ serves the church. Spectacular videos filling huge screens augment the proceedings on stage. But the high point of the weekend is the sermon preached by Joe White, a Texas college football coach who heard the call from God. In this video, Joe plays a cardiologist. So where are we going now? Atlanta. Somebody in the Phillips Arena needs a new heart. I'll catch you guys on Monday, I guess. All right. Summoned to Atlanta, he has come on an emergency call to save some lives. How we doing? Who made that emergency phone call in here anyway? Here, Joe asks the men in the audience to throw off their chains and receive a brand new heart. If you look in scripture, and you see Abraham where it all began, you know, who was a pagan, but God gave him a brand new heart. And you look at Moses, he was an angry murderer, but God gave Moses a brand new heart. And somebody is being told in this arena tonight that Satan is going to kill you and you're going to die in your sins. But I'm going to tell you, men, I came to this arena tonight to say that God wants to give you a brand new heart. A pilot from the United States Air Force who flew jets for the Air Force thought he couldn't give up pornography, thought he would die in pornography. But God gave this man a brand new heart and for one year now this man is living completely free from porn. Men who came inside the arena thinking they were Christians. But realizing in the arena as they looked at the purity of Christ, realizing that they'd been duped into thinking that watered down halfway commitments were true salvation. This is the moment of the altar call. Joe invites everyone to write down their greatest worries and then pin them to the cross, passing their burden on to Jesus. you and a holy God, anything, that one secret sin that you've been afraid to tell everybody, even your wife doesn't know what it is, write it down here. Nobody's going to read it, but God is, where they'll hang there. Come back home. 
been too long. In a ritual of purification, the men ask forgiveness of God and receive the promise of a new beginning. Like all evangelicals, the promise keepers believe in a direct and personal relation with Jesus. Here they ask him for his grace. That night in Atlanta, 400 men were born again. With it comes a faith they hope will change their lives. Just as you are. I've been carrying a man's blue bandana for one year, and I've been talking about a man that I met a year ago in Arena who came from LA and gave up his gang life. And here's Royce tonight, one year later, free from the gang. Promise Keepers, that's what Promise Keepers is all about. It's friends bringing friends to Jesus. I mean, a week ago, I had a chance to visit with the President of the United States, and I asked him, what should I tell the men? What should I tell the men of Promise Keepers when I meet with them? And he said, just thank them for the prayers for Laura and I. All I want is their prayers. And men, whether you're President Bush in the White House, or whether you're Royce in Los Angeles, or whether you're Jim from Atlanta, Georgia, prayer works. Prayer changes things. Near the end of the convention, the president of Promise Keepers reminds the men that their mission has just begun. Now they must share their faith with those around them. So when you leave here, think of yourself as being on mission. So whether you are a doctor or an attorney, a businessman, carpenter, a politician, whether you're in education or law enforcement, you need to be on mission. It doesn't stop here. And we want to fulfill all of those promises to our wives, our sons and daughters. You're to be salt and light in your community. Statistics show that of men who make a faith commitment to Christ, 90%, in 90% of the cases, their whole family will follow. First their wife, usually, and then their children. So by reaching the men, we're reaching the whole family. And, and thereby, we're changing the nation and the world. We went to visit Larry Ross, who runs the most important Christian PR company. Billy Graham has been his main client for 23 years, but others include The Promise Keepers and Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion. The day begins with a prayer and a reading from the Bible. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you know our needs before we even ask. Father, for those who need healing for Chris and Rebecca. Larry Ross's Bob, mission is to evangelize America's popular culture. We have films like The Passion of the Christ, where they're kind of Trojan horse projects. They're art first, entertaining films that tell a good story. But the evangelism happens over coffee as you discuss questions generated by the film with someone who would never go with you to church, but would go with you to a theater. Then movie producers uh, are the new high priests of our culture. Several years ago, the trade publication PR Week did a cover story called When Your Client is God. One of the things I said to them was, I have to always keep in mind that I'm not just representing my client, but I'm representing the kingdom of God. The trauma of September 11th brought many Americans back to the Bible and its traditional values. They reject the porn overrunning the internet, the garbage on TV, and the phony rebellion touted in commercials and advertising. As Rob Boston, who helps run Americans United for Separation of Church and State, a fundamentalist watchdog group explains. So much of, of popular culture, according to the religious right, is decadent, is focused on sexuality, is not appropriate. Now, it's interesting. I mean, I, I happen to agree on some respects in that area. I have children myself, and there are things about popular culture that I'm definitely wanting to shield them from. The answer the fundamentalists have is to sort of create a parallel structure. The religious revival has changed America's cultural landscape. Lifeway, for example, is an evangelical franchise where every cultural commodity finds its Christian equivalent. Children's toys, 
teenage guides to love and sex, even candies. There's a desire there, certainly, to look at popular culture and say, how can we be involved in this? There's Christian pop bands, there's Christian rock bands, there's Christian rap bands, <laughs> there's, there's all Christian diets. I mean, anything that has a, an existence in the larger American culture has an echo in the Christian fundamentalist community. The America of 2004 is a long way from the political and cultural ferment of the 60s and 70s. What happened? Evangelical Christians want to return to the Bible-based worldview of the Founding Fathers who started America. They believe in Scripture and in the power of a God unconstrained by scientific laws who in seven days created heaven and earth and man and woman. This is the only book that you need, and this is the Bible. It's God's completed Word. If a person believes in their heart that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and confesses with their mouth that He is Lord, then the Bible says that person will be saved. The great conservative turn began in 1979 in Dallas, Texas, home to the Southern Baptist Convention, whose 16 million members formed the largest Protestant church in America. They are proudly conservative and much courted by politicians. It was one of their pastors, Dr. Paige Patterson, who launched the revolution. His cause was the inerrancy, the lack of error in the Bible, which he believes to be literally and non-scientifically true. Surrounded by portraits of past seminary presidents, Dr. Patterson explained his mission. When I was a child growing up uh, in a minister's home, my father often told me, son, there is coming a great confrontation in our denomination. Uh, he instructed me very carefully about what he had seen happen in other mainline denominations as they went into decline as a result of their loss of confidence in God's Word. Disagreements over war, abortion, and God's Word pointed to a growing distance between the liberal pulpit and the pews. Dr. Patterson believed that to survive, the Christian worldview had to be anchored in the literal interpretation of the Bible, and he began mobilizing the faithful church by church. What we did was we actually eventually found a pastor and a layperson in all 50 states of the United States who had our same concerns and we helped them learn how they could help educate the people in the churches as to exactly what was going on. We worked it in much of a precinct politic uh, type approach to urge people to come to the Southern Baptist Convention and vote. Patterson's tactic worked. In 1979, after a century of progress, the fundamentalists took over the convention and reinstituted the Bible as a final religious, historical, and scientific authority. And so today, uh, Southern Baptists in America look like their founding fathers looked, uh, who first came to this country looking for religious liberty and freedom and believing in the Bible and in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, recognizing the need to inculcate Christian wisdom from the earliest age, Dr. Patterson is a firm believer in homeschooling. Homeschooling is... Um, an idea that goes right back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 in the Bible. It uh, hopefully will uh, prevent too much careerism happening among mothers. Uh, we believe that the mother's place in the home is strategically important. We just don't believe there's a better teacher than mom anywhere. Traditionally, many evangelicals were averse to involvement in the secular and especially political world. But in the 80s, feeling their values under attack, activist pastors urged their flocks to engage in the political process. In 1988, televangelist Pat Robertson made a run for the Republican Party's presidential nomination against George Bush Sr., whom he considered too moderate. But the effort failed. Robertson's platform was just too radical for its time. That setback only spurred Robertson to greater efforts. In 1989, he created the Christian Coalition, a grassroots organizing effort aimed at getting evangelicals into the voting booth and into political office. 
For many, this was cause for alarm. Groups like Americans United for Separation of Church and State, often composed of both lay people and concerned clergy, closely tracked the progress of the religious right. Here, Rob Boston, who once wrote a book about Robertson called The Most Dangerous Man in America, explains the right strategy for gaining power. The Christian Coalition was founded, as Robertson described it, as a, a national grassroots organization of people who were going to, they would say, take America back. Now, I always found that phrase to be very disturbing. Uh, taking America back implies that somebody has it now who doesn't rightfully own it, and, and that they were going to seize that uh, from them in some way. What they planned to do was this. They planned to uh, create a collection of people who would run for office at the local level, and then they would work their way up the chain. So they would start running out for local offices, like maybe the school boards, maybe the town council, maybe the county council, then state office, state legislature, U.S. Congress, and you work your way up the chain. And this goes back to a political model they had, that the way you change things in the country is from the bottom up, not from the top down. Just as it had in the takeover of the Southern Baptist Convention, this grassroots approach began yielding successes across the country. One witness to these events, the anti-fundamentalist pastor, Dr. Bruce Prescott, describes these early efforts as he saw them unfold in Houston, Texas, power base for an up-and-coming politician named George W. Bush. And uh, I've got a video to show you here. In 1990, Prescott accidentally received a video in the mail which shocked him terribly. Produced by an extreme right-wing group, this was not meant to be seen by the general public. It has never been broadcast before. Restoring America. How you can impact civil government. With Dr. Stephen Hotze. Biblical values and standards are under constant attack, not only in the media, but also in many churches. Abortion on demand is the law of the land. The blood of over 20 million unborn children cries out to God for judgment. Now this video I received in the mail when I was a pastor in Houston, Texas. Now this is like the third or fourth largest city in the United States. And what it was, it was sent to, quote, conservative, Christians to try to engage them in political process. For people like you Dr. Prescott, this video is evidence of a darker a vision Christian behind the mainstream pieties of groups the like the Christian coalition. The central conflict is over the question of who is sovereign, who has the final and absolute authority, the state or God. God alone is sovereign over these institutions. His moral absolutes govern their actions. This is the biblical worldview. What they're advocating is theocracy. The church should be running the state. Well, the theocrats are not going to tell you that they're trying to set up a theocratic kingdom. What they're going to do is they're going to say, America has always been a Christian nation. And it resonates with Christian experience because most Americans are Christians. And it makes people think, well, there's nothing wrong with that. The seats of our civil government must be filled by men who fear God and who are willing to sacrifice to obey His commandments and administrate His laws no matter the personal cost. Business we will the focus of the video is tactical. It describes how local militants can gain control first of their district or precinct, then of the state's Republican Party. Mr. Chairman, my name is Greg Bloom. I'd like to propose a resolution to um, make sure we never have a state income tax in the great state of Texas. I've submitted my three This would then the allow Secretary. them to legislate the changes in the law, follows, here against abortion, uh, gay Texas rights, taxes, brightly. or even public schooling. Six states in the United States that Article 8 of the Texas Constitution shall be amended by adding Section 24 to read as follows. No tax may be imposed on the income of individuals or corporations. All in favor of Mr. Bloom's ban on state income tax resolution, please rise. That was done in an independent, fundamental Baptist church Remember? in Houston. Okay, it was in my back door of my church. Against, I recognized the people that were in there as members of this congregation. I recognized the pastor of that church that's in here. Mr. Bloom's resolution passes. <laughs> Ten to nine. Ten to nine. In Texas, the Republican Party has adopted a pro-Christian platform, 
And in the last 15 years, evangelical Christians have become a decisive, sometimes determinant voice within the Republican Party. They built an entire machine that they put at the service then of right-wing candidates. And they first of all defeated the moderate candidates within the Republican Party. They put the time and energy and effort into building a very strong organization to the point now that it dominates, it completely dominates the Republican Party. So that's their whole base right now. I'm so thankful that you know, we've got Bush right now and he's up there and he's making the office an honorable one right now. As a man, a godly man, I think. We return to Atlanta to the Promise Keepers Convention, where the faithful are reminded of the moral values for which they must do battle. In 2004, the men are given a special mission, the promise to vote. But this is not, the president of Promise Keepers explains, a political issue. This is not about promoting liberal or conservative values, it's about voting for biblical values. And party lines as well. So it's not the Republicans carrying this issue or the Democrats carrying this issue. We are encouraging men to vote from the biblical perspective because that's, who we do, that's what we do. We encourage men to passionately follow Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ means many things to many people, and most of them are welcome at Promise Keepers, which claims to be politically nonpartisan. In 2004, that's hard to believe, as President Bush runs against a pro-choice, pro-gay Democrat. A child in a womb is innocent. A child in a womb cannot protect himself. If you walk into the voting booth and say, this guy, I'm opposed to abortion, but this guy is going to help me do better financially, and you vote for that guy, let me tell you something. You've just taken a bribe in your wallet against the innocent. There is blood all over your wallet and you've become an accessory to murder because you won't trust Christ to take care of your wallet and your financial need. God already 2,000 years ago said what a family is. It's a man and a woman, not a man and a man. And so I've had gays challenge me on this. And in the sense, I said, wait a minute, first of all, you're not gay. And I'm taking the word back. What do you mean? Because gay does not mean sexual preference. Gay relates to an attitude of heart. It relates to a disposition of spirit, but it's not sex. So you're not really gay because you cannot live without God and really be gay. You are sodomite. That's what it is. It's sodomite. You're sodomy. That's what it is. For evangelical Christians, missionary work is a sacred duty. They must share their faith with the world. Dallas, one of the centers of this movement, is home to missions great and small. I think Dallas is special to the rest of the United States. The financial affluence that we have here in Dallas and that so many people are successful from a worldly standpoint they realize that it's not fulfilling. Man, there's something greater that I can do with my life. And so they really, they want to funnel all that, all that energy and focus and talent that they use to make a lot of money. They realize, man, I can focus that towards the kingdom. Global Fellowship is a relatively modest effort, co-created by Nathan Sheets, a marketing expert who could have made a fortune in business, but chose instead to spread the word. Well, this is a great time to be serving the Lord. In fact, it's easier now more than ever to reach the ends of the earth with the gospel. We bring a lot of business people with us on short-term mission trips because we want to be able to provide them an opportunity to go beyond just writing a check and giving it. But they can be used in their spiritual gift set to be able to reach people for the gospel. And so I've had an opportunity to bring business in, businessmen with me that are worth hundreds of millions of dollars and yet they walk around these villages and simply just telling people about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. I cannot help but believe that every man, every God-fearing man has dreamed of the day that he could stand in a place like this 
and tell of his faith in Christ. I've thought about it all of my life. These people have very little. They're happy and they smile. Global Fellowship also hosts short training seminars for amateur missionaries. One of its tools is a simple series of universal gestures. And the first symbol is you always start with prayer. And so a church would start with prayer. Then we go out and we proclaim the gospel, doing evangelism. And now that we have new believers, we, we disciple those new believers. We come alongside them and teach what it means to be a follower of Christ. And now that we have multiple new disciples, we congregate those new disciples into a newly established church. And once that church has been established, then we train up new leaders and give them a vision for planning a new church. And then we mobilize them and focus to multiply, to go out and establish new churches. And then it starts over again with prayer, evangelism, discipleship, congregation, more leadership development, and church multiplication all over again. Missionary work is a traditional calling among evangelicals. Early American settlers worked among the Indians, and in the 19th century, they spread across the globe. Southwestern Baptist Seminary is the largest of that creed's five training schools. Each year, 4,000 graduates are sent out to evangelize the world's lost peoples. We return to Dr. Paige Patterson. Though he's traveled the planet on behalf of the gospel, he maintains his Texas sense of humor, happy to subvert stereotypes about ministers or assign the origin of the species its proper place in the hands of a baboon. This is the largest of all of the members of the antelope family. This is an eland. When I took this particular eland, uh, we were at a time in Zimbabwe when many of the people just could not get much protein in their diet at all. So whenever we would take an animal like this, then we would, uh, uh, of course, uh, take the head for mounting, but then the meat we took into the villages. We were able to feed with this one antelope. He's so large, we were able to feed three different villages uh, make their uh, day and give them plenty to eat. Dr. Patterson warns us that the lot of a missionary is not all fun and games. Well here at Southwestern Seminary, um, just to put it bluntly, we don't rear any, any wimps. Um, if a student is looking for an easy assignment, he would be well counseled to go someplace else to school. Uh, if he wants to put it all on the line for the Lord, if he's willing to give his life for Christ, if necessary, then he's found the right place to come. Southwestern graduates are trained to endure whatever privations are necessary to spread the gospel. After the fall of Saddam, more than a few went to Iraq. One of these missionaries was Brennan. We were there uh, primarily just to show humanitarian uh, relief to the people of Iraq in any way that we could. We did uh, renovate an entire elementary school. We did a little bit of food distribution, but also many days just playing soccer with some of the Iraqi children. The Bible says that God is a God of all the nations and he is interested in the people of all the nations. And so, in light of that, we go to the nations and we take what is good news about salvation found in Jesus Christ. Having said that, we weren't there to uh, proselytize by coercion. If the subject of religion came up, then of course we would discuss it. In the pursuit of their mission, tragedy ensued. On March 15th, just outside Mosul, their team came under attack and four people were killed. One of them was David, the leader of the group. We were saddened, uh, naturally, um, by the loss of our friends um, who were doing a good work there uh, and showing compassion to the Iraqi people. But um, we're saddened, but not uh, completely without hope, because obviously, uh, as followers of Christ and believers in the Bible, uh, the message of the Bible is one of eternal life. And so we know that uh, through faith in Christ, we will see David again someday. So then, what drives these young missionaries to risk their lives for Jesus? What keeps me strong is that I know where people are going if I don't share what 
Christ did for me. And they're going to hell. <laughs> and the Bible describes this place as something that is not good. You know, if I didn't know it, there's nothing on my shoulders. But I do know it. So I feel like I have this responsibility to tell as many people as I can. People are going to hell and I don't want them to. <laughs> and I know the answer to the problem. <laughs> In the last 30 years, evangelicals have started thousands of churches across the third world. Guatemala is one of their greatest successes. 30 years ago, the vast majority of its 12 million citizens were Catholic. Today, Christian evangelicals make up almost half the population. This church, with the Hebrew name of El Shaddai, has been the fastest growing in the last few years. Its pastor is Harold Caballeros, a Pentecostal who oversees about 130 congregations. Trained as a lawyer, he and his wife Cecilia saw the light on a trip to Fort Worth, Texas. Hasta que vino una llamada de Dios. My call from God came in 1981 in an extraordinary way. I don't speak English, but I had gone to a convention in Fort Worth, Texas. And that's when the miracle happened. As soon as I got there, I understood everything as if people were speaking in Spanish. For some, called charismatics, being born again brings with it certain gifts. Like the first apostles who received the Holy Spirit on the day of the Pentecost, these charismatics can spontaneously speak in unknown languages. It's called talking in tongues. There are almost 20,000 evangelical congregations in Guatemala today. The Catholic Church, all but overwhelmed, has been winnowed down to 760 priests. One of them, Father Rojas, explains why they can't compete. If you walk around this neighborhood, you will find little church-run community centers everywhere. That's how they reach people emotionally. They make them feel welcome and offer guidance. And in small groups, people are more open about expressing their religious feelings. It's a setting which is well suited to the spirituality of our people. In nuestra gente. As stipulated in the Old Testament, worshippers must pay a tithe, a holy tax comprising 10% of their earnings. On top of that, they donate to their local churches and make contributions to various Christian causes. Please take the envelopes and prepare them so we can share this bounty with joy in our hearts. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we ask you to receive these offerings as I ask you, Lord, to return and multiply these gifts to your faithful in the name of Holy Jesus. Amen. On these envelopes, the faithful inscribe the amount advanced toward their tithes and their church. On the back of the envelope, the worshiper writes his name, telephone number, and email. Records are kept of who gave how much on which day. The money serves the cause of kingdom growth, the expansion of the church through constant recruitment of new members. Like the American televangelists, Harold Caballeros uses the airwaves to proselytize. He runs 25 radio stations and presents a variety of TV programs. They're bombarding us 24 hours a day. How do they do it? I think for every 24 hours of programming, they spend 20 hours asking for money. It's like they're selling salvation. What they're doing today is exactly what Luther approached the church for doing in his day. They're selling salvation. They're selling indulgences. It's unbelievable. 
They even take money from Catholics. The great advantage of radio is in helping spread the message I've been preaching for so many years. It's an evangelical who will bring bread to your table and help pay for your children's education. Nowadays, the Lord works very directly. In impoverished countries with dysfunctional governments, evangelicals supply the basic building blocks of civil society. Guatemala is a failed state. Chaos and danger are everywhere. In this ultra-violent society, the evangelical churches provide basic neighborhood services and after-school programs that keep children out of harm's way. In Guatemala, the evangelicals have created a parallel society, a dense network of schools, clinics, hospitals, even universities, which fill the void left by the state. Throughout the country, church acolytes knit the faithful together through an interweave of social, financial, and religious ties. Such networks have allowed the emergence of a new, largely Christian middle class. The evangelicals want to transform Guatemala into a born-again Christian society. That is the dream of Harold Caballeros. Here he preaches in front of a giant sign proclaiming 2020, the year in his vision when Christ will become Lord of Guatemala. What is our dream? We dream of a different Guatemala. Our vision is of a Christian country. We live to inscribe Guatemala onto the list of nations which will be saved. Our hope is to be a Christian nation which will be saved. And what is a nation but the people who live in it? These are the people in need of a change, of learning, so they can use that learning to transform themselves. Only then can we have peace. Shalom, Harmony. To help him in his quest, Dr. Caballeros works with Robert Cowan, a retired American college professor. Together, they are building an evangelical university. I believe that uh, God has a special plan for Guatemala. There have been prophecies about this, uh, Guatemala, light of, the, uh, of nations. And uh, I believe it's because of the spirituality of the Guatemalan people. I think that they're much more open to uh, spirituality than uh, people in uh, more developed nations uh, like the United States because of the abundance of rational thinking and uh, Greek philosophy uh, that influence uh, people uh, on their thinking and uh, make them less open to spirituality. I believe that the Holy Spirit is beginning to flow immensely throughout Guatemala. There are fabulous things that are happening and going to happen, and they're going to happen in an accelerated manner. This evening, Reverend Caballeros has good news for his parishioners. This very month of August, Brothers Roger and Oscar will go to Virginia Beach to Regent University. I requested, and Pat Robinson has agreed, to provide 10 scholarships for Guatemalans. Pat Robertson is perhaps America's most famous televangelist. This one-time presidential challenger to George H.W. Bush has become a billionaire and a man of unquestioned international stature. He is the owner of CBN, the Christian Broadcasting Network, whose dozens of regional affiliates broadcast throughout the world. Seldom appearing outside his own media, he granted us a rare interview. All the decorating which we recorded on the soundstage of his own studio. Dr. Robertson was one of the first to mass evangelize Central America, and he's pleased with the results. 
this is sweeping Latin America. It's not just Guatemala. It's El Salvador. It's uh, it's Honduras. It's uh, um, Nicaragua. It's uh, you go down into Colombia and Peru and Chile and Brazil, particularly huge evangelical churches, and just a, a powerful move of God among those some 300 million people in Latin America. Robertson not only controls a global television network, he also has his own school, Regent University. Created 25 years ago, it has served to propagate his proudly conservative vision. Basically, we have nearly 3,000 students, so let's go ahead and take a look. And then straight ahead is the Robertson School of Government, and that's the building that we're going to enter. Functioning mainly as a graduate school, Regent offers degrees in areas such as leadership, law, education, communications, and business, all taught according to firm fundamentalist principles. Students come not only from across the United States, but from the whole world. And you know, it's just, it's been in Dr. Robertson's heart to establish kind of an Ivy League school where people can come and get the best education we do have people that are working in the government. We have um, people that are working in local politics that are very active in that. We've got lawyers that come out of here that are practicing in the, you know, in the courts right now. You know, we have a lot of ministry leaders throughout. You know, you raise people up and then you uh, allow them to go out with the gifts that God has given them. After a lecture on Christian jurisprudence, one of the students explains why American justice must recognize its biblical roots. What we have here are a continued legal education for attorneys, for law professors who are here learning about how Christianity, how religion uh, interrelates with the law and how really it was the foundation of law itself. And so uh, the, the difficulty that we're studying here is how the American tradition can continue if all we're going to do is look at the law and not the foundation of the law. And uh, we quickly find that without that foundation of the law, it deteriorates away along with the deterioration of America itself. One of the people that was dean here at Regent University was Kay Cole James, and now she's over all of the HR and personnel for President Bush. I know that she oversees all of the personnel at the White House. Once dean of government at Regent, James now oversees two million federal employees. In the American press, Robertson is most often linked with the Reverend Jerry Falwell, who also has a school, Liberty University. Falwell says of himself that he is not a radical, he is a fanatic. His university was inaugurated in 1982 by the vice president at that time, George H.W. Bush. Reverend Falwell's arch enemy is secular humanism, but his targets, like Robertson's, are judges. Built upon the Judeo-Christian ethic. Runaway judges have almost wrecked the country the last 40 years, expelling God from schoolhouses and now courthouses, and from the public square, legalizing abortion on demand, attempting to legalize same-sex marriage, attempting to remove under God from the Pledge of Allegiance and in God we trust from our currency, attempting to create a secular nation out of a Christian nation which our founders clearly intended. And your job and mine is to refuse to let them do it. I am a, I'm a junkyard dog. But we want to train men and women in the legal profession to be legislators and judges and leaders who can help as the salt of the earth along with our seminarians, the light of the world, fellas, salt and light, to bring this nation back to God and back to the faith of our fathers.
As the election approaches, Falwell and Robertson are pushing for an overhaul of America's Supreme Court, which after the 2000 election ruling, many in the United States already find to be too far to the right. Dr. Robertson attacks the Supreme Court for defending secular over Christian values, such as the right to life or to pray in school. The Supreme Court has emphasized in recent decisions uh, the uh, rights of the individual against the rights of the majority. And although I am a fervent believer in individual liberty and individual rights, I don't think any nation should give a veto over its most cherished beliefs to a small handful of people who don't believe in anything. Robertson is hoping that Bush's re-election will bring the appointment of new Supreme Court justices, whose ideas on the social role of religion might be a bit closer to his own. This has been one of his hardest battles. But what is he battling against? Uh, it's hard to say what's behind it. I mean, from a religious standpoint, you'd say it's Satan. I think we, we have a spiritual war, and I think uh, there's spiritual forces. Um, the radical feminists are extremely shrill and violent. They, they want to push their agenda, the homosexual, lesbian agenda, the uh, uh, pursuit of abortion on demand, the radical lifestyles. And they don't seem to want any of the restraints that were associated with Christianity, the kind of uh, world that I grew up in. Uh, they, they, they keep saying, we want our space, we want freedom. And they somehow think that Bush is limiting uh, their freedom. And I think there's also a fear among the Democrats. The, their stronghold has been the courts. And if George Bush is elected to office with a strong Republican majority in the House and the Senate, then the Supreme Court is going to change in these next four years, and so the, 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 the radical left will have lost their stronghold on power. In America, neither Congress nor the President can overrule the Supreme Court. Their say is final in all matters of law. As the court moves, so moves America, and all nine judges are appointed for life. How can this be? How can the church... One subject of very special concern to many fundamentalists is America's Middle East policy. Over the last 25 years, so-called Christian Zionists have exerted a growing influence in favor of Israel's territorial expansion and against anything that could lead to a Palestinian state. To show their solidarity with the chosen people, Christian Zionists travel to Israel regularly. Here they are greeted by Prime Minister Ariel Sharon. Dear friends, welcome to Jerusalem. When you are here, you don't need a guidebook because you have the Bible in your hands. The fundamentalist commitment to Israel stems from their reading of the Bible, especially Ezekiel and Revelations as prophecy. According to an evangelical tradition dating back to the 18th century, the second coming of Christ must be preceded by the ingathering of the Jews and the restoration of the original state of Israel, which happened in 1948. Much of the Bible talks about what's going to happen in the end time, time of wars, rumors of wars, time of great famine, natural upheaval of various kinds, many of the things that we're seeing happen right now. All of this we see as a prelude leading up to the moment when Christ shall return to the earth. In the last 40 years, this tradition has become ever more popular as world events, Israel's acquisition of the West Bank, Saddam Hussein's reconstruction of Babylon seem to confirm specific biblical prophecies. Since the 1970s, Hal Lindsey has sold tens of millions of books about the end times. I find myself in a very challenging position in today's world. Bible prophecy gives me a scenario of how world powers will align themselves in the final great conflict that will bring the present world order to an end. These are factors I do know from prophecy. Restored Israel and Jerusalem will be at the center of world concern. The surrounding nations, which are today all Muslim, 
will be in a continuous dispute with Israel over the possession of the land and Jerusalem. This will eventually compel all the world powers to become involved in trying to resolve the conflict. The situation between the Israelis and the Muslim nations is following the predicted script so closely that it's awesome even to me. It is this biblical knowledge which impels Pat Robertson to reject the current roadmap to peace. We feel that the return of the Jews to Israel uh, is foretold in the Bible. It is prophesied by God and is something that God's going to come about regardless of the quartet and regardless of <laughs> Yasser Arafat and regardless of all the terrorists, that that land was given by God to the Jews and that the state of Israel is a fulfillment of prophecy. So that, that is our feeling and we, we deeply support Israel for that reason. In his sermons, Robertson goes even further, comparing Allah to a pagan god. The crescent moon has been the symbol of uh, the Islamic countries. My contention is, is that Allah is the moon god of Mecca, uh, who looks very much like the Phoenician and Babylonian god Baal. But whatever he is, whoever he is, he's not Jehovah who appeared to the Jews on Mount Sinai. Mark Hitchcock is a scholar who has written many books on Bible prophecy. He believes that the end times will begin with the sudden ascension of all who have ever accepted Christ into the heavens. This is the rapture which precedes seven years of tribulation the reign of the Antichrist, the great battle of Armageddon, and ultimately, the return of Christ. This is a book as American Bible prophecy that talks about uh, the role of America uh, in the end times. America will remain a strong nation to protect Israel till the end times, but I think God's judgment on America will be at the rapture of the church. Those who are true believers in Jesus Christ will be raptured or caught up to heaven before this time of great tribulation that's going to come in the world. Depending on what statistics you look at, somewhere between 8% and 23% of the people in America are evangelical Christians. And if my understanding of the end times is right, when the rapture takes place, that's somewhere between 20 to 60 million people that disappear from the United States. Uh, that's a lot of people. So I believe that what will happen to America is when this rapture takes place, America will, will fall really under the judgment of God. And the power in the world will shift at that time from America uh, to, to Europe. Then Europe may even be joined together and become uh, the great empire of the Antichrist in the end times. The idea that the book of Revelation sets out a plausible scenario for the end of the world is a commonly held view among the religious right. Now, the question then becomes, do people high up really believe this? Is it something that uh, has infiltrated the government? Is it something that uh, we need to be worried about? And, and that's a very difficult question to answer. There have been people who have come to me over the years since Bush took office, for example, and have said, does he really believe this stuff? Or is he just saying this to get votes? With a politician, you never really can tell. I would like to have somebody ask him those questions. How do you interpret, as a born-again Christian, the book of Revelation? Does the United States play a role? How does that affect your public policy, or more importantly, your foreign policy? We need to know that. The actors are now all on stage. The final drama is about to begin. The question is, are you ready to meet the Almighty God? Now is the time to settle your eternal destiny. But every one of us is invited by Jesus to live a life of wisdom. If you would ask him to awaken the sage within you. You say, Jesus, I don't want to grow up in the dark. I don't want to live a life where I keep putting myself in a cage. I want to live free. Would you say it with me? I am a warrior of light. Me. Come on, stand up! I was born to be a poet! I was born to be a poet. Jesus.
Jesus, awaken the inner sage. Jesus.